is Curious, and I'm your host, Sharon Mosley. On today's show, we explore Zen with guest Kaku Robert Walker Gunn, guiding teacher at the Empty Hand Zen Center in New Rochelle. Kaku is the former pastor of Community Church of Syosset, Long Island. He's a psychotherapist, counselor, professor at the New York Theological Seminary, a member of the Buddhist Council of New York, and the accomplished author of three books, Journey into Emptiness and One Bright Pearl, Volumes 1 and 2. Welcome, Kaku. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. It's a pleasure to be here. So I want to start with your name. What does Kaku mean? Is that, that's your Dharma name, correct? What is a Dharma name and what does Kaku mean? Okay, so when you uh, uh, become a Buddhist, mm -hmm. uh, the way that you do that is by studying what we call the precepts. Mm -hmm. And the precepts are basic guidelines for living. Mm -hmm. And when you receive those precepts from your teacher, you are given a Dharma name. And one of the names that I was given was Kaku. And that is actually a, an English transliteration of Japanese characters, mm. the meaning of which is Song of Emptiness. Ah. So my name ne means Song of Emptiness. So how does a teacher come up with a Dharma name for a student? A lot of deep thought. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it, it, it's a sign of the insight that a teacher has for a student to find a name that in some way fits the person. What is emptiness exactly? That's a good question. <laughs> um, so emptiness is uh, the English word for um, a word that arises in, in Buddhism as a very fundamental quality. So for example, if you have a painting if you notice, uh, say it's a brush painting mm -hmm. and you have a circle, mm -hmm. usually an in so. So when you make that, you'll notice that the brush leaves its marks and where the brush's hairs did not cover, you have white. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of emptiness. Emptiness is that which makes form possible. So, for example, without there being some space between you and me, we would be smashed all together. <laughs> so emptiness is what allows each thing to be what it is, which may be different from other things. Huh. So what is Zen? People talk about Zen all the time in terms of music, in terms of space, in terms of, um, for lack of a better word, for, of quality of oneself. I'm, I'm I feel Zen today. What exactly <laughs> is Zen? If you told me that, I would ask you what you mean by that. So <laughs> it's, um, it's not exactly clear. I think we use the word popularly in many different ways. Just, you know, you just gave an example. Um, Zen is about awareness. Mm -hmm. It's about our, our mind and what we do with our awareness and, and trying to be uh, alert. Mm -hmm to each moment as it is. So many of us spend a lot of time thinking about whatever may be thinking, and we can be thinking about it even while something else is going on. Mm -hmm. So most of us run around with you know, only some percentage of awareness uh, on at what's actually happening in the moment. So Zen is like a, an attempt to get us back to right now, what's mm -hmm. happening right now. So when you say that, aren't we, we have to plan our lives and we have to um, have history. So what is presence then? What do you mean present? So right now, you and I are sitting here and we've talked about your you know, smock with, you know, what kind of green is in there that doesn't really show up on the screen. <laughs> and we've talked about uh, some other things that we have um, had conversations about before re regarding the Zen practice. Mm -hmm. It's being aware and it is uh, paying attention. Hmm. So the mindfulness movement uh, is, uh, is another uh, version of Buddhist practice. 
Uh, and it's emphasizing basically the same thing that Zen emphasizes, which is awareness, uh, seeing, being fully present in the moment. Being fully present means not only being aware of what's around oneself, but also what we're thinking within our own selves. Hmm. What feelings we may be having, what, may, what thoughts may be going through our mind while we're in fact talking about something else. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's multidimensional awareness hmm. and paying attention to that so that everything is, is brought into a, a, a fuller consciousness. So what is Zen practice exactly? Well, in Zen practice, the most important single thing that we do is Zazen, which means sitting Zen. Mm -hmm. So uh, we sit or we may, uh, we may be using a cushion, we may be using a chair. Um, the Buddha is pictured sometimes as, as even lying down, but you know, most of us would go to sleep too easily <laughs> if we did that. So we try to sit up and, um, and pay, just pay attention to our breath. And as we're paying attention to our breath, usually we start out by counting our breath. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're trying to let thoughts go so that we don't get stuck in some kind of repetition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we talk about obsessions, obsessions are simply thoughts that get jammed up. Mm -hmm. And so it's on a repeat cycle. It's ba -dip, ba -dip, ba -dip, ba -dip, you know, mm -hmm. it's, you know, the repetition thing. And um, in Zen practice, we try to be aware of each moment and what's happening. In and each then moment. when you're aware of each moment, does that require you to do something? Or? Not at all, simply to be aware of it. Hmm. Hmm. And the more we are able to be aware of what's happening inside us as well as outside us, the more, um, the, the, the freer we become to act in a way that's responsible and appropriate to the moment. Okay, we're a, a, a progress society. So how long does it take you to get to that place where you're in the moment? Hmm. <laughs> Well, some of us are tougher cookies than others and um, <laughs> require, you know, a lot of more uh, stuff to be uh, let go of. Mm. And uh, some of us kind of catch it, you know, early on. But in any case, as we sit with ourselves in meditation, uh, everything comes up. Mm. I mean, you know, we're often sitting for hours on end. Mm -hmm. um, and we may have a break, you know, where we do some walking and uh, that sort of thing. But, but we will have days and weeks, perhaps, uh, where we have intensive meditation and we'll sit for a very long time. And as we do that, what's happening is we're getting to know ourselves on a much deeper level. So I'm curious, when you're sitting for these long periods of time, when do you go to the bathroom? During the break. Oh, so you, so get a you break. have to do... You yeah. have to sit until the break, and then um, you can go to the bathroom. Now, is it important or not important to sit with a group of people or sit by yourself? That's a very important point because many of us find ourselves sitting by ourselves and having a kind of meditation. I mean, for example, we'll go to the beach and do that. Mm -hmm. Or we'll watch a sunset and we'll, you know, we'll kind of just peaceful out, mm -hmm. right? But as a daily practice, we don't always have time to go to the beach. Mm -hmm. But um, what we can look for is a few minutes to simply be with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And being with ourselves is really the most important thing so that we're not running away from ourselves mm. by catching on to a thought or obsessing about what's going to happen next, mm. Um, mm. getting caught up in uh, emotions of anxiety, fear, um, whatever feelings may be coming up. Um, is Zen different from other Buddhist practices? Yes. Um, it's. It's different, and at the same time, it's the same. Uh, what is the same is the direction of awakening. 
having as our purpose becoming increasingly aware and alert to each moment's reality. That's in common with all of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Zen has a particular form of doing that, which involves you know, crossing our legs and sitting in a chair or on a cushion. Um, and you know, there's a structure of how much time you spend doing the sitting Zen, which we call Zazen, and how much time you spend walking, mm -hmm. which we call Kinhen, because even when we're walking in the slow kinhin, mm -hmm. we're, um, we're still paying attention to our breath and to the movement of our body. So we're bringing meditation in motion, mm -hmm. with, in, into our motion. I found, I found um, in my own practice, Kenyan can be difficult because then you have to be aware of your relationship with the person in front of you. And then that creates all of these uh, Thoughts. Why are they moving so slow? <laughs> Hurry up. Why did they stop? You know, those sorts of things. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, what do you do in those situations? Because those are the things that happen when you're outside of the Zendo, yes. right? Yes. You, you're online. Somebody's taking too long. Somebody can't find their money, or you're stuck in traffic. So it's, it's, it's almost like a similar practice. So uh, it, it is similar. And in fact, um, I would say the thing to do when you're stuck in traffic and your mind goes off on tangents, like it always does, um, is bring your focus back to your breath. You can bring your focus back to your breath without stopping paying attention to the car in front of you, behind you, and on either side of you. Hmm. So, so you're still, but by bringing your attention back to your breath, it, it helps you stay fully in the moment. Okay. Um, <clears throat> does one worship the Buddha in Zen practice? Well, worship is a Western term, okay. and um, uh, it would not be appropriate to call what we do for, in relation to the statue of the Buddha as a worship. We do kneel and, and make prostrations uh, in front of the Buddha. And why do we do that? Mm. Well, the Buddha is nothing more than a symbol of the self that is larger than the individual self. Mm. So when I'm bowing to the Buddha, I am bowing to my deepest self as well as the selves of the entire world, mm. including my dog. <laughs> Let's talk about your dog since you <laughs> brought him up. What is his name and why did you name him that? Okay, so um, uh, my dog is named Dogen. Mm -hmm. And Dogen is uh, the 13th century Zen master from Japan who founded the Soto school of Zen Buddhism in Japan. Mm -hmm. And so Dogen is like, you know, one of my heroes, right? <laughs> so. Uh, at the particular time in my life when I decided I wanted another dog, um, I was um, in recovery from uh, uh, cancer. Hmm. And I wanted a dog back in my life. I wanted animal life, mm -hmm. not just, you know, I was living in Queens at the time. You know, I wanted something more than concrete steel and, you know, <laughs> Uh, chaos. And um, so I found this puppy. Uh, you found him? Well, I mean, I found online the breed mm -hmm. that I had never heard of before. It's called Barbet, uh, B-A-R-B-E-T, which is a French water dog. Oh. And um, I looked for where they would be found, and there was one place upstate that a woman had just had a litter. So I went up to see um, and picked this puppy and decided to name him Dogen. <laughs> and why did I name him after my Zen master? Um, because I figured this dog would have something to teach me. Ah. And um, indeed he does. What has he taught you so far? Well, first of all, he teaches me how to get up in the morning before I'm ready. <laughs> He also teaches me by being amazingly adaptive mm -hmm. to whatever's happening. Mm -hmm. 
um, he, he rarely complains. And you know, the only time I hear him complain is when I leave him upstairs and I'm downstairs <laughs> in the Zen Center and we hear this, you know, and it's so precious, you know. Um, he is precious. He is so precious. It's a, he's an amazing part of my life. So now. you mentioned um, uh, surviving cancer. Mm. So how did that transform your practice or did it? Well, I have been studying Zen for, I don't know, 20, 30 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so this was uh, three years ago. So, so I have, you know, some Zen practice under my belt, so mm -hmm. to speak. And um, uh, I was very fortunate, first of all, um, to, for, for it to be discovered that I had this cancer. And the only reason it was discovered is because I, I turned yellow for several days and uh, I went to see a doctor and he sent me to another doctor and that doctor freaked out and, um, and immediately called uh, and, and um, set up an appointment for me to be seen in the emergency room. Oh. And so it was quite sudden and um, uh, you know, with x-ray and all of the other picture taking that happens, um, it was discovered I had uh, cancer of the pancreas, mm. which, um, you know, when I woke up from surgery, I said, well, you know, how long have I got to live? Mm. And because pancreas, you know, pancreatic cancer can be very fast acting. Yes. And um, yes. Um, in my experience, you know, people often died within three months. Yes. So, um, so I was uh, happy to have uh, the nurse reply that, well, that's the old days, and that um, as long as, in my case, uh, it was discovered very early, then um, the prospects for full recovery uh, are very, very strong. Wow. So That's pretty amazing. It has been amazing, yeah. I wanted to ask you, what are the three transformative things that you think happened in your life? The three events that transformed your life, I would say. Hmm. Wow. How much time do we have? <laughs> well, you, you're always welcome to come back. <laughs> and, and facts will make a show for you. Well, uh, two things come to mind immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, first one is the birth of my brother. My brother was born when I was five, mm -hmm. and he had cerebral palsy at birth. Mm -hmm. So his, uh, his brain essentially was paralyzed because he didn't, it didn't get enough oxygen when he was immediately born. He was premature by several months. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as a result of that, he, um, he never walked. Mm -hmm. And so his presence in our life, meaning my whole family, um, was absolutely central to who we were and what we did. Mm -hmm. um, so, what do you think he taught you? Uh, actually, I would say my parents taught me to be patient with him. Ah. And uh, you know, so for example, he was uh, somewhat spastic and. Uh, it was a long time before he could ever, you know, put a spoon to his mouth. Mm -hmm. So we fed him, you know, mm -hmm. by hand for, for years. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he, uh, he learned how to dress himself, but um, it took a long time mm -hmm. for him to dress himself. Mm -hmm. so, so I think the first thing that I learned from my brother was patience. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, was to respect uh, the fact that he needed help getting around. Mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> and so another thing that it taught me, I, th I would say us, I think surely my sister would agree, um, was responsibility. Mm -hmm. that, that built into it, like it or not, 
Mm -hmm. We are responsible for somebody. Mm -hmm. And um, so how to be responsible for my brother mm -hmm. uh, was this another, you know, very central message. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I would say he has been pivotal to my spiritual life in the sense that uh, uh, his condition made me question all forms of suffering in the world. How so? Why is there suffering? That's the big question. Why is there suffering? I myself a lot. Big pardon? I said I wonder that myself a yeah, lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, why, isn't, why aren't things easy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and Buddhism says that um, we are all perfect and complete, lacking nothing from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's so, then why, what's all the, you know, why is there so much pain and suffering mm -hmm. involved? And, um, and how do we deal with that? Um, so in that sense, there's a direct link between my brother and my ultimately turning to Buddhism mm -hmm. uh, after, you know, 40 years or so as a Protestant Christian pastor. Mm -hmm. um, well, you, I, start, I started Buddhism before that. But. So do you see any similarities in the practices? Is there, is there one common thread that you see between your current practice and your past practice? Oh, absolutely. For me, it's a direct line. Mm -hmm. There's no, uh, I don't feel any conflict between uh, Christianity and Buddhism. Uh, I see Jesus and the Buddha as um, the same phenomena and, and, you know. How so? Well, um, uh, they were both people who uh, paid attention to the suffering around them mm. and sought in their different ways a resolution to that question of suffering. Both solutions had this in common, that um, the f liberation from suffering comes from our letting go of trying to be God, hmm. from our letting go of trying to run the show out of our own egos. Hmm. And they approached how one does that differently, but I think that is the primary agenda of spiritual uh, path is uh, freedom from uh, the ego and uh, uh, the freedom to be for helping others, mm -hmm. compassion. Now, I don't, we have five minutes left and I don't want to run out of time before you tell me your last two transformative oh. <laughs> events. <laughs> Let's see, what did I think? Um, so, so I mentioned my brother, mm -hmm. uh, definitely. So the second one uh, was when I was um, a month shy of 10 years old and I had a uh, conversion experience. I was raised as a Southern Methodist uh -huh. and uh, it was a fundamentalist uh, version of Christianity. Uh, and I, uh, when on September uh, 13th, 1953, I had a conversion in which I felt the presence of God in me and I was called down to the altar to give my life to Christ. Mm -hmm. And I did, and that was a turning point for the rest of my life. Hmm. So. And the last one? Um, well, the last one I would say has to do with family. Hmm. Um, and I'm kind of, um, uh, uh, what I'm thinking of uh, right now is both the family that I came from mm -hmm. and uh, the family that I created with my wife, uh, Susan, uh, and uh, our two daughters, Allison and Laura. Mm -hmm. And now I have grandchildren. I, oh. have, I have four grandsons, two daughters and four grandsons. So, you know, the, the genders are skipping generations. And, <laughs> but but I, I, would, I would say family as 
as the, um, uh, the, the container that teaches us about love and about the difficulties of love. Mm -hmm. And you can't learn one without the other. This, that's true. So it involves our own suffering mm -hmm. and coming to terms with, with what we did get and what we didn't get and what we needed, mm -hmm. <laughs> which are all different. You know? So I guess I would say that you know, the third thing is family. Okay. Well, um, Kaku, I hope you return to talk to us again, or maybe we'll create your own, what did you call it? Zen? Oh. A, a call-in show? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. You say, what is, what is Zen? Or, um, yeah, something like that. Call Oh, gosh, I can't even remember what you said. I know, said. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the two of us together is not a good duo. <laughs> um, I think it was, uh, it was call in Zen or a call in show for Zen. People yeah, would call for, yeah. and ask Zen questions. <laughs> so <clears throat> if someone wanted to get started with Zen, we have two minutes left, Kaku. What is the first thing they would do? I would say uh, look for a teacher. Hmm. Uh, look for a, a sangha. <clears throat> so, um, What's a sangha? A sangha is the community of people that are gathered together to practice okay. Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And uh, to find a sangha with a teacher that has a, a good deal of uh, experience and um, listen to the teacher uh, to what he or she says and see whether that person says anything that catches your your heart mm. Mm. and uh, let that be your guide mm. so well, thank you, Kaku. Thank you for this invitation. Oh, I appreciate it. I don't think we covered everything on my little trusty uh, list. I think we're. I think we're more to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you come back. Uh, thank you. And keep us curious. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching, and good night.